the imperial period, uh, which came to an end, to a violent end in 1975, in the revolution in 1975, was often presented in a manner, in a way which is a very simplistic uh, rendering of a very complicated history of uh, Ethiopia. The emperor is my great-grandfather. There's a documentary streaming now about one of the last modern monarchies in Africa. Grandpa was an emperor is a personal account told by family members of Ethiopian emperor Haile Selassie. It explores his life, 44-year reign, and the fallout from the violent overthrow of Ethiopia's feudal system. The stature of the emperor on a global scale was incredible. Dr. Shamela Skulema is a professor of Africana Studies at Stony Brook University in New York. He was featured in Grandpa Was an Emperor as a Historical Expert. Together, we will explore some themes of the modern-day Ethiopian Empire. Usually, when we think about the imperial period, we think of the period in terms of its its uh, absolute nature of the monarchy, for instance, meaning a, a, a ruler uh, uh, with ability, the capacity, with the resources to exercise almost total control, total control over every every part of the country. Uh, that was not the case, in fact, in, in the history of Ethiopia. If you go back even before the uh, Emperor Ayla Selassie's time, then you have kings like Menelik, for instance, uh, King Menelik or King Johannes, who, uh, whose authority, political authority, was based on this compromise, uh, on these negotiations with regional ru rulers, rulers from different parts of the country, uh, the Rasses and the Dijalmaj, and the other rulers from uh, southern and eastern parts of the country. The lack of capacity on the part of the rulers to exercise absolute control in imperial Ethiopia means there are other rival centers of power. Uh, having a complicated relationships with with the with the monarchy, with the with the king of kings. So the idea of this highly centralized state control from the center, at the expense of the regions, the various regions of the country, is not borne out by historical evidence. There is always this fundamental disconnect between the Ethiopian desire to modernize, but the lack of resources to achieve this goal of modernization. Because there, there, there is not, uh, there was not enough resource. I mean, this is a country which was uh, based on a tra fundamentally traditional economy, a traditional feudal agricultural economy that did not produce enough surplus to support the kind of modernization, the kind of rationalization the kings were planning. Uh, in the 20th century, despite all the, uh, the, the the problems, the challenge, like the lack of resources that we talked about, despite the uh, the exclusionary nature of the system, because vast majority of Ethiopians were not uh, were not citizens with agency and with with participating in the political process as active, autonomous subjects. That's not the case. But in spite of that, there were significant achievements that laid the foundations for what is known as modern Ethiopia, meaning whether it is in terms of laying down the foundations of a modern political system, uh, the, the, civil, the, the, the civil service, the bureaucracy for instance, uh, the modern civil bureaucracy in Ethiopia was created during those days, those times. Education, the investment, this, this commitment to investing in education, introducing modern education to Ethiopia is so important, so key. Uh, to Ethiopia's development. Investment in education, investment in infrastructure, uh, in those days, in spite of the limited resources, is, is an important achievement of that period. I think that needs to be recognized. With this education and with this scholarship, with Ethiopians going abroad and learning about the rest of the world, uh, the progress made in other areas of the world, uh, Ethiopians learn uh, that their country was not was not truly independent. Uh, that their country was not uh, a modern country. So there is this idea of modernity, uh, which now included conceptions, 
conceptions of justice, questions of justice and freedom and equality and popular sovereignty. So, so the students uh, who are growing uh, who are growing during that period, uh, many of them with exposure to the modern world, uh, partly because of scholarship, imperial scholarship, uh, to Europe and to the uh, to the U.S. Uh, we're not um, we're not happy about the way Ethiopia was was uh, was developing. We are not happy about the trajectory of Ethiopia's political economy development. I think the fundamental uh, point here is that there is in those days, or this continues to be to this day, a fundamental disparity, which is morally objectionable, in my opinion. Uh, between the uh, these extremely wealthy, but a minority wealthy people on the one hand, and the vast majority of Ethiopians who are very poor, uh, who live beyond uh, many... Uh, this is a country where a meal a day was a luxury for a long period of time. and But some parts of uh, the population enjoy uh, considerable, considerable power and wealth. Uh, known for their ostentatious uh, uh, consumption, displaying this wealth uh, in a country which is known for its abject poverty. So, yeah, there is no denying the fact that there is always this inequality, this fundamental disparity that inexorably led to the revolution in 97475. So there is a level of empowerment that many Ethiopians as individuals, but also communities, enjoyed as a result of the revolutionary experience, like, for instance, ownership, land ownership, right? Land ownership. Many Ethiopians uh, were given access to ownership of land as a result of the radical policies of the revolution in 1975. But then there are, I mean, but then you have to also rethink if this was really the case, because uh, in many ways, uh, the state that was expected to be a more open, uh, a more more open, uh, a state that would more liberal or progressive, that a state that would open up the political space, so that there would be opposition, there would be freedom of expression, political opposition and freedom of expression, that did not happen eventually, because like the period of the Derg became one of a bloody a bloody uh, experience in, in modern Ethiopian history. So you can say there are areas that we made significant strides, especially in terms of these ideas of freedom and justice and equality and self-determination. But there are also areas where we, uh, we stagnated or, or even uh, probably uh, moved backwards, like the level of security, for instance in terms of this idea of security, which is a critical public good, and which is also a major fund, uh, responsibility of a state to ensure public security. And now we've seen over the last many, many years that it is not secure to move from one part of the country to another. We have created these artificial boundaries separating Ethiopians, uh, one region from another. So that kind of insecurity is a phenomenon that gained momentum, especially over the last 30 years. So we lost in that case.